Chapter 10. Weekday lunch at Artist Hall, Lucette between Marina and the Governess, Van between Marina and Arda, Dak the golden brown stoat under the table, either between Arda and Mademoiselle La Riviere, or between Lucette and Marina. Vans secretly disliked dogs, especially at meals, and especially that smallish, longish freak with a gamey breath. Arch and grandiloquent, Arda would be describing a dream, a natural history wonder, a special bellatristic device, Paul Berger's monologue interior borrowed from old Leo or some ludicrous blunder in the current column of Elsie de Nord, a vulgar literary demi-mundane who thought that Leoven went about Moscow in a nagolni tulip, quote, a music's sheepskin coat, bare side out, bloom side in, end of quote. As defined in a dictionary, our commentator produced like a conjurer, never to be procurable by Elsie's her spectacular handling of subordinate clauses, her parenthetic asides, her sensual stressing of adjacent monosyllables. Quote, idiot Elsie simply can't read, end of quote. All this somehow finished by acting upon Van as artificial excitements and exotic torture caresses might have done in an aphrodisiac, sinistral direction that he both resented and perversely enjoyed. My precious, her mother called her, punctuating Arter's discourse with little ejaculations. Terribly funny. Oh, I adore that, but also indulging in more admonitory remarks, such as, do sit a wee bit straighter, or eat, my precious, accenting the eat with a motherly urge very unlike the malice of her daughter's spondaic sarcasms. Arda now sitting straight, incurving her supple spine in her chair, then as the dream or adventure or whatever she was relating reached a climax, bending over the place from which Price had prudently removed her plate. And suddenly all elbows sprawling forward, invading the table, then leaning back, extravagantly making mouths, illustrating long, long with both hands up, up. My precious, you haven't tried the, oh Price, bring the, the what? The rope for the fake ear's bare-bottomed child to climb up in the melting blue? It was sort of long, long, I mean, interrupting herself. Like a tentacle. No, let me see. Shake of head, jerk of features, as if unknotting a tangled skein with one quick tug. No, enormous purple-pink plums, one with a wet yellow burst split. And so there I was, the tumbling hair of the hand flying to the temples, sketching but not terminating the brushing off strand stroke. Then a sudden peal of rough ripped laughter ending in a moist cough. No, but seriously, mother, you must imagine me utterly speechless, screaming speechlessly as I realized. At the third or fourth meal, Van also realized something. Far from being a bright lass showing off for the benefit of a newcomer, Arter's behavior was a desperate and rather clever attempt to pre prevent Marina from appropriating the conversation and transforming it into a lecture on the theater. Marina, on the other hand, while awaiting a chance to trot out her troika of hobby horses, took some professional pleasure in playing the hackneyed part of a fond mother, proud of her daughter's charm and humor, and herself charmingly and humorously lenient toward their brash circumstantiality. She was showing off, not Arter. And when Van had understood the true situation, he would take advantage of a pause which Marina was on the point of filling with some choice Stanislavskiana to launch ardor upon the troubled waters of Botany Bay, a voyage which at other times he dreaded, but which now proved to be the safest and easiest course for his girl. This was particularly important at dinner since Lucette and her governess had an earlier evening meal upstairs so that Mademoiselle La Riviere was not there and at those critical moments... Mademoiselle Le Rivier was not there at those critical moments and could not be relied on to take over from lagging ardor. With a breezy account of her work on a new novella of her composition, her famous diamond necklace was in the last polis polishing stage. Or with memories of Van's early boyhood, such as those eminently acceptable ones concerning his beloved Russian tutor, 
who gently courted Mademoiselle La Riviere, wrote decadent Russian verse in sprung rhythm, and drank in Russian solitude. Then, that yellow thingum, pointing at a flowerette prettily depicted on an ecker crown plate. Is it a buttercup? Ardor. No, that yellow flower is the common marsh marigold, Caltha palustrius. In this country, peasants miscall it. Cowslip. Though, of course, the true cowslip, Primula veris, is a different plant altogether. I see, said Van. Yes, indeed, began Marina. When I was playing Ophelia, the fact that I had once collected flowers helped, no doubt, said Ardor. Now the Russian word for marsh marigold is kuroslep, which music, musics in Tartary misapply, poor slaves, to the buttercup, or else kaljuznitsa, as used quite properly in Kaluga, USA. Ah, said Van, as in the case of many flowers, Ardor went on with a mad scholar's quiet smile. The unfortunate French name of our plant, Souci d'eau, has been traduced, or shall we say, transfigured. Flowers into bloomers, punned Van Bean. Je vous en prie, mes enfants, put in Marina, who had been following the conversation with difficulty and now, through a secondary misunderstanding, thought the reference was to the undergarment. By chance, this very morning, said Ardor, not deigning to enlighten her mother, our learned governess, who was also yours, Van, and who, first time she pronounced it at that botanical lesson, is pretty hard on English-speaking trans, transmongrelizers, monkeys called ursin howlers, though I suspect her reasons are more chauvinistic than artistic and moral drew my attention, my wavering attention, to some really gorgeous bloomers, as you call them, Van. In a Mr. Fowley's Soy de Sant literal version called Sensitive in a recent Elsian rave, Sensitive, of Memoir, a poem by Rimbaud, which she fortunately and farsightedly made me learn by heart, though I suspect she prefers Mousset and Copé. Les robes vertes et détentes des filets quoted Van triumphantly. Exactly, mimicking Dan. Well, Le Rivier allows me to read him only in the Fulleton anthology, the same you have apparently, but I shall obtain his Uvers complaints very soon. Oh, very soon. Much sooner than anybody thinks. Incidentally, she will come down after tucking in Lucette, our darling copperhead, who by now should be in her green nightgown. Angel moi, pleaded Marina. I'm sure Van cannot be interested in Lucette's nightdress. The nuance of willows and counting the little sheep on her ciel de lit, which foully turns into the sky's bed instead of bed cellar. But to go back to our poor flower, the forged Louis Dior and that collection of fouled French is the transformation of Suicida O, our marsh marigold, into the asinine care of the water, although he had at his disposal dozens of synonyms, such as Molly Bob, Mary Bud, May Bubble, and many other nicknames associated with fertility feasts, whatever those are. On the other hand, said Van, one can well imagine a similarly, similarly bilingual Miss Rivers checking a French version of, say, Marvel's Garden. Oh, cried Ardor. I can recite Le Yardin in my own transversion. Let me see. In vain on se muse a Gagner, La Oca, La Baie du Palmier. To win the palm, the oaky or bays, shouted Van. You know, children, interrupted Marina resolutely with calming gestures of both hands. When I was your age, Ardor, and my brother was your age, Van, we talked about croquette and ponies and puppies and the last fete d'enfants and the next picnic and, oh, millions of nice normal things, but never, never of old French botanists and God knows what. But you just said you collected flowers, said Ardor. Oh, just one season, somewhere in Switzerland. I don't remember when. It does not matter now. The reference was to Ivan Dermanov. He had died of lung cancer years ago in a sanatorium not far from X, somewhere in Switzerland where Van was born eight years later. Marina often mentioned Ivan, who had been a famous violinist at 18, but without any special show of emotion, so that Erder now 
noted with surprise that her father's heavy makeup had started to thaw under a sudden flood of tears. Maybe some allergy to flat, dry old flowers, an attack of hay fever, or gentian gentianitis, as a slightly later diagnosis might have shown retrospectively. She blew her nose with the sound of an elephant, as she said to herself, as she said herself, and here Mademoiselle La Riviere came down for coffee and recollections of Vans, as a bombine angelique who adored Anouf Anz, the precious dear Gilbert Swan, et la lesbi de Catul, and who had learned all by himself to release the adoration as soon as the kerosene lamp had left the mobile bedroom in his black nurse's fist. Chapter 11. A few days after Van's arrival, Uncle Dan came by the morning train from town for his habitual weekend stay with his family. Van happened to run into him as Uncle Dan was crossing the hall. The butler very charmingly thought Van signaled to his master who the tall boy was, was by setting one hand three feet from the ground and then notching it up higher and higher. An altitude, altitudinal code that our young six-footer alone understood. Van saw the little red-haired gentleman glance with perplexity at old Boutalin, who hastened to whisper Van's name. Mr. Daniel Veen had a curious manner when advancing toward a guest of dipping the fingers of his stiffly held right hand into his coat pocket and holding them there in a kind of purifying operation until the exact moment of the handshake came. He informed Van that it was going to rain in a few minutes because it had started to rain at Lador, and the rain, he said, took about half an hour to reach Artis. Van thought this was a quip and chuckled politely, but Uncle Dan looked perplexed again and staring at Van with pale fish eyes inquired if he had familiarized himself with the environs, how many languages he knew, and would he like to buy for a few kopecks a Red Cross lottery ticket. No, thank you, said Van. I have enough of my own lotteries. And his uncle stared again, but sort of sideways. Tea was served in the drawing room, and everybody was rather silent and subdued, and presently Uncle Dan retired to his study, pulling a folded newspaper out of an inner pocket, and no sooner had he left the room than a window flew open all by itself, and a powerful shower started to drum upon the lyrodendron and imperialis leaves outside, and the conversation became general and loud. Not long did the rain last, or rather stay. It continued on its presumable way to Raduga or Ladoga or Kaluga or Luga, shedding an uncompleted rainbow over Artis Hall. Uncle Dan, in an overstuffed chair, was trying to read with the aid of one of the dwarf dictionaries for undemanding tourists, which helped him to decipher foreign art catalogs, an article apparently devoted to oystering in a Dutch-language illustrated paper somebody on the train had abandoned opposite him when an abominable tumult started to spread from room to room through the whole house. The sportive dackle, one ear flapping, the other upturned and showing its gray mottled pink, rapidly moving his comical legs and skidding on the parquetry as he executed abrupt turns, was in the act of carrying away, to a suitable hiding place where to worry it, a sizable wad of blood-soaked cotton wool, snatched somewhere upstairs. Ardor, Marina, and two maids were pursuing the merry animal, but he was impossible to corner among all the Baroque furniture as he tore through innum innumerable doorways. Suddenly, the whole chase veered past Uncle Dan's armchair and shot out again. Good Lord, he exclaimed on catching sight of the gory trophy. Somebody must have chopped off a thumb. Patting his thighs in his chair, he sought and retrieved from under the footstool the vest pocket word book and went back to his paper. But a second later had to look up Groot, which he had been groping for when disturbed. The simplicity of its meaning annoyed him. Through an open French door, Dak led his pursuers into the garden. There on the third lawn, Ardor overtook him with the flying plunge used in American football. 
a kind of rugby game cadets played at one time on the wet turfy banks of the Goodson River. Simultaneously, Mademoiselle La Riviere rose from the bench where she had been paring Lucette's fingernails, and pointing her scissors at Blanche, who had rushed up with a paper bag, she accused the young slattern of a glaring precedent, namely of having once dropped a hairpin in Lucette's cot. Une machine l'encom casse fallait, blessera l'enfant à la fesse. Marina, however, who had a Russian noblewoman's morbid fear of offending an inferior, declared the incident closed. Neharoshaya, Neharoshaya Sobaka, crooned Ardor, with great aspiratory and civilatory emphasis as she gathered into her arms the now lootless but completely unabashed bad dog. <laughs>